Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to our last program for this season of uh, local history. Uh, my guest this evening is a distinguished fisherman from Port Stanley, uh, Art Grayling. Art, uh, thank you very much for coming on the show. And uh, <clears throat> Art is going to describe his career as a fisherman at Port Stanley, and uh, we're going to get into a lot of other topics as well. And I think, Art, we may as well just start out with uh, <clears throat> when did you start fishing? Well, that goes back quite a while, too. So, uh, actually, George, I suppose, probably went back till I was more or less going to high school and dealing around with fishing. Well, I understand that you went to high school and you came up here to go to grade 10, and then you decided to chuck that and you went to work for the Canned Iron Foundry for a while. Yeah, I did that, too, yeah. And you I did had several jobs and before I really settled down to go fishing. Yeah. And uh, during the time, <laughs> now you mentioned it, uh, when I went to the Iron Foundry, I think that was uh, during the war. Yeah. And uh, and at that time, a lot of people, like the younger generation, wouldn't uh, <coughs> know what I'm talking about. But at that time, when you were 16, you were froze to a job. Yeah. And uh, your father was in the Army at that time, was he? Yeah, he was in the Army. There. So you decided to uh, <coughs> become he independent? He joined the Army in 39. Did he really? Uh -huh. yeah. so what well, outfit did he join up with? Well, he joined in with the uh, Elgin Regiment. Oh, he was with the Elgin Regiment. Uh -huh. I see. Uh -huh. Well, now tell me, Art, you, uh, uh, you didn't like the Iron Foundry, uh, and you started uh, fishing in a rowboat down at Port Stanley, eh? Well, that's quite true. Uh, I had several jobs before that. I worked with Joe Sharp. That's before, you know, I mean, like blacksmithing and yeah. one thing or another. But I did uh, start fishing with an old uh, friend of mine. Uh, his name was Fred Gilbert. Oh, yeah. And uh, actually, that's where I started fishing. And uh, that's going back many moons ago. And uh, if I recall, I think he had the only outboard motor at that time. Is that a fact? Time. The only outboard motor? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think the, at that time, if I recall, um, there was only two rowboats in that creek at that time. I think Art Carey's father mm -hmm. run night lines the yeah. north end of the creek, and Russell Parker had the south end of the creek, yeah. and then Fred Gilbert had the license for the lake. I think it was a $20 rowboat license at the time, mm -hmm. and he fished gillnets with the rowboat with an outboard motor. Is that a fact? And that's where I originally started fishing. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought uh, Fred Gilbert also did some catfish uh, fishing. Well, that's quite true. That's quite true. In fact, uh, I remember very well catching tons of fish with Fred Gilbert, and I learned a lot from him. And uh, his sons went into the war, you know, like when yeah. the war. Well, then I was going to high school at the time, and I remember many days I used to go fishing with him at five o'clock in the morning, and I'd come in after we had four or five hundred pounds, and I'd catch the LMPS car, the LMPS train, I should say, and uh, I would go to St. Thomas and go to school, and I couldn't wait to get back to go fishing that night. <laughs> yeah. But actually, that's where I started fishing. Yeah. Well, now, then you, you decided you liked that, working with Fred Gilbert, and you liked fishing. <clears throat> and you know, I suppose you like the independence of it. And now, meanwhile, the, uh, you're doing this all during the war when your father's away. And then when he comes back, uh, you and your father go into partnership. <coughs> well, I think you missed something there, uh, George. Or George. Uh, like, uh, in the meantime, I had acquired a license myself. And uh, I was doing a little cat fishing on night lines. Well then, uh, like I say, when my father came back from overseas, they had preference to uh, gill net license. And, and uh, it was through my father that we did get a gill net license and uh, we commenced to fish with gill nets. I see. But you were still fishing with a lifeboat, eh? Oh yeah, we had a lifeboat. Uh, it was about 18 foot and uh, we had maybe a 15 or 18 horse outboard onto it. And, and we used to pull the nets by hand, and uh, my dad, he'd roll the boat backwards, and when I'd set the nets off the front of the boat, it was strictly a hand bombing outfit, but we caught fish, you know. 
Well, then, uh, at the same time when you were uh, working on uh, with uh, Fred Gilbert, didn't you also have a spell on one of, with the Donald Mac, a steam tug? <coughs> oh yeah, yeah. Like uh, I had several jobs. Like, uh, well, tell us about the steam tug, the operation you went through with that. Uh, well, that would take me a long time. Well, to tell just you tell about us that. a little bit about it. Well, uh, fishing today is very easy compared with years ago. Uh, I don't know how to start on this, George, but uh, the first thing you did in the morning, you had to be there. That was the main thing. You had to be there in the morning. Nowadays, it's pretty hard to get there to meet anybody in the morning. <laughs> yeah. uh, if you wasn't there in the morning, there'd be somebody to take your place. Yeah. I mean, this is an old A lot guy. of competition for... Well, jobs are scarce, and, uh, and uh, if you wasn't there, there'd be somebody to take your place. Yeah. Now... When I started fishing on the Donald Mac, which I thought I really had it made, this was an off season. Like yeah. we could only fish catfish periodically in the summer months. Yeah. And uh, when we uh, could, there's a little boat, eh? So when it comes to fall fishing, well, we'd have to get a job in a bigger boat. So uh, I thought I really had it made. I went gill netting on a big boat, which I learned a lot, and uh, which I did. Uh, Who ran the Donald Mac? Captain Morgan, Tom Morgan, long gone. And uh, in fact, I think I'm just about one of that crew that's left. There's several crews I fished with. It scares me to think about <laughs> how many <laughs> crews I fished with and only one left. But uh, oh, I guess there'd be a couple left. I think Norm McKeever's still alive. He fished on it. Uh, the first thing in those days, uh, when you come down in the morning, we had to uh, get on the boat and we had to pull the ashes which consisted of uh, a 45-gallon barrel was cut in half. Yeah. The engineer, he would uh, shovel the ashes into it, and with a three-block pulley, we'd pull it up, and then we'd carry it back to the gangway door, and we'd dump it. Well, we'd do that several times in the morning, then we're on our way to pull the nets. But uh, after pulling the nets and setting them, but, uh, on our way back in, we'd do the same thing, like we'd have to just fire no. by coal, no. you see. So we'd uh, pull the ashes again. No. And if you didn't watch yourself, you could burn yourself. They were hot ashes. Oh, I bet. Yeah. And uh, we'd have to have leather gloves on. But then uh, we'd come to the dock, and periodically, every two or three days, we'd have to shovel on a bunch of coal, which we'd tie up the coal dock before we unload the fish. Well, how many tons of coal did you shovel on that? Well, I suppose maybe every three days we put maybe five, six ton of coal on, yeah. and uh, we'd shovel it on deck, and yeah. the engineer, he would push it down into the bunkers, you see. Well, Art, how did they, uh, uh, how did they divide? You you went out in that, you had a five or six man crew, eh? Now, uh, That's true. Uh, how was that organized? How was the catch divided up, or what were the arrangements? <coughs> well, those days, uh, it was strictly share fishing. It's still share fishing today. And in those days, it was 60% for the boat and 40% for the crew. Now, which means uh, if you had a six-man crew, if 15 cents a pound yeah. would give the uh, 40% would give you a dollar a hundred. Like if you had a thousand pounds of fish, yeah. each man on the boat would make ten bucks. Yeah. So uh, that's the way it went. Uh, the price of the fish. Uh, dominated uh, your uh, paycheck. Yeah. So if the fish price was high, you, or if you had a big haul, uh, it could be very profitable. Uh, well, well, relatively speaking. Oh yeah. Well, years ago, it was always the first boat out that got the high price of fish, and then as the season went on, the price went down. But everybody tried to eat out early years ago to get mm -hmm. the high price fish. But it seems anymore, it doesn't matter whether you go early or not, the uh, fish are pretty well standard price. Yeah, I suppose uh, some of that was tied up with the uh, Lenten practice. People wanted to eat fish That is quite true. Uh, Lent, the yeah. Jewish holidays had a lot to do with it. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. The Jewish holidays had a lot to do with it. Well, now, um, you and your dad, uh, when you got started, uh, you built yourself a wooden boat. Your first uh, boat for fishing out in the lake was one you built yourself. I remember it very well. What was the name of that? Well, uh, after we got it built, we uh, I got married and we had a daughter called Heather, and so naturally we called the boat Heather G. Mm -hmm. But uh, we built the boat, 
and uh, we were sponsored by Wilson Loader at the time, which money wasn't too brisk. Yeah. And uh, they financed us to go ahead and, you know, yeah. we, they financed us with the yeah. money to buy the lumber, and we went ahead and built it. And in turn, we put the fish into them and paid it off, more or less. Eh? And you were telling me when you were building that that you didn't steam those planks. You built it of pine, eh? Uh, you bent those planks. Uh, we had uh, clear pine, and uh, well, we did. We soaked the planks in water. Yeah. And uh, there was an old timer down there at one time, a name of Walt Brown. And uh, it's going back quite a while ago, but uh, he was quite a man about uh, building boats. And uh, we put the clamps to him and yeah. bent the planks and we split the odd board but he put a board up against the plank and put the pl uh, put the clamps to it and yeah. the ones that stayed in we yeah. put the nails the cloak nails to them and corked it afterwards oh, and yeah. uh, he break the, he break the odd plank doing now uh, that must have been one of the last wooden boats was it around port uh, I don't know if it was the last wooden boat or not uh, George uh, like uh, I don't know whether it was or not, like uh, when Saab Taylor moved, like you know where I am now, we're on 174 Main, but uh, south of us, maybe you can see in this picture here, uh, south of us, uh, Saab Taylor had a, a boat livery down there, well, <coughs> and he the moved that up above the bridge, the I King see. George Bridge, and uh, he had a Marine Railway in there, and he built a fish tug in there, and he oh. called it the Erie Bell. I think that was the last wooden boat that was ever built in Port Stanley. What are the disadvantages of a wooden boat uh, for the fishing? The disadvantages? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, your disadvantage of a wooden boat would be uh, laying up in the winter. Yeah. Unless you pulled it out. Uh, you had to cut the bo boat out in the winter time with a saw yeah. because uh, they're all co uh, cocked with uh, oakum or yeah. in the creosote. seams, you yeah. see. And uh, if you didn't uh, uh, free those boats, with ice. Well, the ice would pull the corking out of them and it'd leak. I don't know whether the people who are watching this understand the boat's sitting in the water and then when it freezes, uh, you either have two choices. You either keep on cutting the ice all the way around the boat mm, so it's keep the boat free. Keep the uh, boat free of ice or else you lift that boat right up and put it on the Well, that, well nowadays you do lift them out, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have the machinery to do it, eh? Which well, then, is a good way. Yeah. Now, you went from there uh, uh, 1952, you built that boat, eh? Or was it 50? Well, I can't remember the years. I mean, don't, don't quote me on the years, but it's no. quite true. I mean. Yeah. Well, then you moved into the Nosca J, which uh, well, was an iron boat, a steel boat. Yeah, that was a very good boat. We uh, purchased that boat from Lionel Hurley in Port Burwell. And uh, the Nosca J is uh, spelt backwards as Jackson. Yes. Now, that was the foundation of a well, probably two or three fisheries, uh, basically, because George Jackson was a great friend of mine, and uh, I think he had that boat built, and they fish a shoal down Nanticoke, east of Dover. And during that time, uh, uh, they built uh, the Jackson Brothers, and from there on, bigger boats. And then uh, Hurley bought it, and Jim McDonald sailed it, and it wound up in Port Barrel. That's where Lionel Hurley uh, had it, and we bought it from Lionel Hurley. Yeah. Now, when we got that boat, I thought I had an ocean liner then, Did you? compared to what we had. You know? Well, that was a 45-foot all-steel boat, eh? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, then you went uh, on from the Nosca J. What was your next boat? Well, I believe at one time uh, we were fishing Nosca J, and I thought I had a little bit of engine trouble with it, and uh, which I really didn't come to think of it, but we got a little excited with quite a few fish around, and uh, the standing clipper was for sale. So looking at the fish that was out in the lake and looking at the, the boat the way it was, we thought, well, gee, we better grab the clipper and catch those fish because they were out there for the taking. So we bought the standing clipper. Uh, well, listen, the Stanley Clipper on this picture, I don't know whether, the, I don't think the camera can pick this up at all. We, uh, uh, well, there it's this not would bad. Be this it's on the right screen here. now. Can you? Um, this would be the Stanley Clipper right here. Yeah. You see, mm -hmm. this is a, this is taken in the early forties. Yeah. This is now, the early Where's 40s. the Nosca? Is it? Well, the Nosca J would not be in this no, picture at but all. But which of the steam tug you uh, worked on? Is that this one here? 
Well, this is Donald Mack here, yeah. where my finger is. That's uh, one of the last steam tugs that ever fished out of Port Stanley that I know of. Now, this time this picture was taken, uh, the Walter Mack was here. This is a Walter Mack, owned by uh, Walter McPherson and uh, George Wilson. And that was a steam tug. Now, there was steam in that boat. You can see the steam. If you look very yeah, closely, yeah, you can see the yeah, steam coming yeah. out. But just later on in those years, they uh, repowered that boat with, with diesel. a diesel. Oh, yeah. So the, the steam tugs, uh, uh, just as the railways, uh, diesels overtook the steam locomotives on the railway, uh, so did the diesel engines overtake the uh, steam tugs and so on on the Great Lakes, eh? Well, it looks like that way, George. Uh, the price of coal, like at the time that when I fished, was probably eight, maybe four to eight dollars a ton. But <laughs> right now, it's the price of potatoes a nickel yeah. a pound. No, right? I know. Like it's about you know a hundred dollars a ton. But but, the but price there was a lot of advantage with diesel. Was like you didn't have to have an engineer. Yeah. And. Uh, it was quite so you, you save a, you save a crew member there, eh? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, well, then you have uh, we come to your last boat. You had the Stanley Clipper, the Oscar J, and then uh, what's your last, your present boat? <coughs> well, the present boat I have now is uh, is uh, named after my grandson, which is a Lee J, but well known as a Luke. Previous to that. But previous to that was a Marion B, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, from Port Dover. And Jimmy Greenslade had the boat, and then Jack Paul had it, and I eventually wound up from him. Yeah. But uh, the, the present boat I have now, I named after my grandson. It's the same boat. My well, this is two grandsons, or one grandson. Yeah, Lee, J. S. Lee, Lee and Jason. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to... Uh, 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 What's happened really in the time that you've been fishing is there have been a lot of changes, eh? Uh, like George, say, if I had the time to sit down and tell you about the changes I've saw in the fishing in the last 40 years, you wouldn't believe it. Well, tell me something about, I have a note here, when you're on a steam tug, I have here there were six men in the boat and one shoreman. Now, what did the shoreman do? Well, the shoreman at that time consisted of one man being ashore. George, uh, at that time, we were dealing with cotton, cotton twine, and linen twine, yeah. and uh, you couldn't, and especially in the spring of the year, you could leave them out for a while. Eh? But when you're dealing with cotton twine and linen twine, there's only a limit to how long you can leave them on the lake, and then you had to wash them and dry them. Yeah. Now, at that time, uh, I don't know if there's a picture here or not. We used to reel the nets. Yeah. Every three or four days in the summer, we'd reel. Well, we used to figure if we were fishing 120 nets that we'd reel 40 of them every day. Yeah. Every three days we'd change them and dry them. Otherwise they'd rot. Yeah. And uh, they'd just deteriorate, you see. <clears throat> and uh, this is why uh, we had a shoreman. Now, we'd come in every day and we'd reel 40 nets. I think there's a picture here. Yeah, somewhere. I have one, but I don't, there's, I think it's right too right small there. for... Uh, right here. Here's yeah, right I think this is too small for the, we would only have two cameras tonight. Mm -hmm. we, uh, They'll never pick that up. Uh, but anyway, that's no a picture. Use, yeah. yeah. Everybody <coughs> probably familiar. With, well, anybody that's uh, 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 anybody that's stuff. familiar with uh, being in Port Stanley yeah. periodically would see these racks that we dry the nets on. Mm -hmm. Now those nets were would be dried. Like the the crew off the boat would reel a box of nets a day, mm -hmm. yeah. six or eight nets. So really, you're, you need about 120 nets, and you're uh, drying 40, and you're using the other 80. Huh? That's quite true. At a certain times of the year, and at other times of the year, you could be using a thousand nets. But uh, well, how much? Uh, let's get into something about price here. How much is a net? Well, let's talk with today's nets. Well, you're looking, George, at a net today. You're looking at a value of anywhere from depends on the length of your net. Yeah, yeah. Now, I would say looking at a net today, a 36 mash net, like the depth of net too. I would say looking at a 36 six uh, mash net that would be about a six or a seven foot net a uh, 50 yard net you'd be looking at thirty dollars thirty dollars and then how many of those nets do you have in your own boat at the present time well right now i haven't got any but i got some new ones coming <laughs> <laughs> but uh, i have uh, probably maybe a couple of thousand nets in my a couple of thousand in nets. my uh, storage yeah you know and well, now, uh, your inventory gets very high There's a lot of hidden 
There's a lot of hidden investment in this fishing oh, industry, I can like see that, people right? wouldn't know of. Yeah. Like you have different sizes of nets for different times of the year. Yeah. If the uh, bigger fish are available, and it depends on what species of fish you're after. Of course, right now we're after perch. As you know, that's the only fish we've got. Well, how does someone get into trouble? Every once in a while you read that uh, someone is arrested for using a wrong kind of net or charged with that. How does that come about? Well, Using oh, too golly. small a net? Too small a mesh? Not really. Uh, not really. Uh, I proved this out to myself. Uh, like it's quite often you can set, uh, like we call it tight twine or big twine or whatever, uh, it's quite often that you could go out in a lake and set nets where there was a school of big fish. And if there was no small fish there, you wouldn't catch them. So therefore, you'd, what fish you would catch in those small nets would be large fish. Yeah. Now, I proved to myself last summer that I could take large nets and set them in a school of small fish. And I'd wind up with nothing but small fish. So the net size really doesn't make that much difference. It depends on the, the size of the school of fish you're into, you see. Well, while we're on nets, uh, we've moved from cotton and linen to uh, nylon and now a stuff called monofilament. Now, what are the big advantages of the modern net compared to those cotton nets outside if you don't have to dry them? <coughs> well, maybe a lot of people wouldn't agree with me on this, but with your... Uh, cotton nets and uh, linen nets, you had to dry them all the yeah. time. And you couldn't lay them away in a damp place or they'd rot. Now with the, the nylon, it's still the same thing. Nylon, you still have to dry it. But yeah. monofilament, you can, it's a plastic web. It's yeah. uh, something that you could possibly get away with with the help today that you yeah. could just wash them, yeah. take the slime out of them or yeah. the bacteria. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you could probably pack it away and get away with it I without see. too much trouble. Yeah. So like, they're, they last a little longer because oh yeah. they don't rot. I water. think your biggest, uh, yeah. your biggest uh, thing with monofilm is the sun would be more hazardous to it than anything. So if you did put them on a thing to dry, you're damaging them with well, the sunlight. That's quite yeah. true. So you're better off to put them in the shade and yeah. uh, keep them wet or whatever. Now I want to go back to another thing to fishing in the 1940s compared to now was cutting ice. Uh, that used to be a, a big winter pastime in Port Stanley. It wasn't a pastime, George. It was a, a livelihood of the town. It was, eh? Oh, yeah. That was kind of the only winter employment there was. That was about the only winter, winter employment there was in Port Stanley that I can remember of. And uh, actually, uh, the way fishing is today and economy and everything, uh, Years ago, the whole town depended on the fishery. Yeah. Now, you might think I'm kidding you on that, no, but no, no, I... uh, what I mean by that is, uh, you're looking at one picture here, you're looking at maybe 10 boats. Well, you're maybe looking at uh, seven men in a boat, so you're looking at maybe 100 people. Well, yeah. maybe the village only in, at that time was only maybe 500, eh? Yeah. You're looking at kind of a hundred families who were dependent on fishing. Eh? Yes, that's quite true. And uh, the grocery man, and I may be wrong, but I, through my own experience, uh, they put you through the winter. Yeah. I mean, nowadays it's all cash and carry, yeah. but believe it or not, the grocery stores did carry the fishermen. Yeah. I'm not saying they carried them all, but I'll bet you 70% yeah. of the fishermen owed a grocery bill in the spring. So everybody, okay. the whole yeah. town was involved in the yeah. fishery. The grocery store, the no. hardware store, the gasoline man, no. and uh, the whole town was involved in the fishery. Well, now, uh, where did you cut that ice? Oh, cutting the ice. Well, uh, the ice was cut off the harbor for a few years, and uh, sometimes I uh, have been told that uh, we've had a couple mild winters, and they couldn't get enough ice at that time, and they've got it off Harding's Pond. That's up uh, northwest of town. That's where one, the one or two mill years. Say, that's yeah. right. That's Harding's Mill. I mean, you're probably familiar yeah. with it. Yeah. Uh, on occasions, they did get ice off there yeah. and uh, store their ice out with a with a mild winter. Well, in a mild winter, it'd be a disaster, eh? If you have no uh, pile of ice to last you through the next they summer. They depended on the natural resources, more or less, eh? Yeah. Well, now, you tell me there were two ways some people had ice houses, some uh, fishing uh, 
owners had their own ice houses stored in a building where uh, all old timers are familiar with what an ice house was, but you didn't have a building. Now, how'd you store your ice? For <coughs> well, um, let's see now. We're getting back in here now. You're talking about when I started in. Uh, yeah, when you were starting fishing and you were cutting ice and uh, piling it beside your shanty there. Well, we had a little problem with the industry there, and uh, I think it was 1962 we took over the building that we have now, which we tore down and yep. had to go government inspect it, of course. But uh, at that time, we uh, acquired a saw, and, and we did cut our own ice. We took ice off the river one year, and uh, what we did, we uh, put it on the north side of the building. That's when we had the old building, and we piled it up, tiered it up, and uh, I had a few friends at that time. We'd, with a few cases of beer or whatever. That's when, uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know whether you realize or not, but those days, which you don't see now, everybody helped one another. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know what happened to the trend there, but I remember at different occasions that uh, a case of beer would go a long ways and uh, going over and have a bee helping the guy yeah, put a roof yeah. on or. So these people would uh, help you pile the ice? Yes, put, I had uh, a few friends in the iron foundry, and yeah. uh, and I told them to come down with a few pounds of fish, whatever, and uh, maybe a beer or two, and they'd come along. And it was, wasn't too much money exchanged. No. And uh, we pyramided this ice up on the north side of my building, and uh, we went and got sawdust, mm. and uh, we covered it with yeah. tar paper. Yeah. And, yeah. And as we uh, used it, we'd take it out, wash it with the hose, and we had a gasoline motor, and uh, there was an ice crusher there. We chopped it up, threw it in, and crushed the ice. So, uh, now one of the modern things, of course, now is that uh, the government stopped you from cutting ice about 1963 or 4. That's right? quite true. Uh, I believe that at that time, uh, they started a gas plant down there. I wasn't. I don't pay too much attention about it, but they started a gas plant down there just up where the new coal was years ago, and it was during the gas shortage, and I think they had done something. I didn't pay much attention to it, but anyway, there was a little bit of oil come out in the river, and uh, they seemed to think that, uh, that the... the, <coughs> that the Pollution. The water was polluted, yeah. and uh, the, the, the ice uh, used on the river wasn't suitable yeah, to put on the fish, you see. Yeah. So uh, the next year, I think it was 63 or 64, we took it out of the lake down yeah. Little Beach. Oh, yeah. Well, then uh, we got away with it that year, and then yeah. eventually they clamped down, and we bought a nice machine using uh, town water. Yeah. I want to... Uh, 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 well, now again, the cutting ice is another uh, change that's taken place in fishing. That was a very tedious job, but uh, uh, now you have an ice making machine. You just make your own ice. And, uh, yeah, you just press a button, and yeah. it comes. Yeah, but except you pay for energy. Eh? What I want to go is we'll take you back to 1962, uh, <clears throat> which uh, uh, you've been fishing quite a while, but you weren't that prosperous yet. Uh, and in 1962, you, uh, the harbor was frozen. Now, you pulled your boat across the ice, so you'd be first into the lake. <clears throat> well, what happened there, George, we, uh, there was, uh, I think that particular fall you're talking about was, uh, there were three or four of us had nets in the lake, and there was a mile or two of ice out there, and what happened, we had a strong wind all the south, southwest. Oh, yeah. And the ice uh, came into the harbor and went right clean to the bottom. And there was just no way that any boat could get out through it. So uh, what happened, we were getting very anxious to get going that spring. Uh, I decided to take the boat. The, the lake was ready to go, but the harbor was yeah. plugged right full of ice, you see. So I had a brainwave. We'd take the boat across the ice. So we did. How would you do that? How would you <laughs> Well, believe it or not, what we did, we just cut a hole in the ice and... I had a friend down there, his name was Blake Berry at the time, he had an army truck. He was on the dock and we dug a hole in the ice, put a railroad tie underneath, railroad tie under the ice and we put a block and tackle onto it and I'd run the boat up in the ice and we just hooked the boat onto it and we just moved it along the ice. <laughs> so after we got along right down the slip dock, we were in the water so we went fishing. 
But that ice was right clean to the bottom. Yeah. And that was the spring of 62. That was 62. Well, now, I, I have a note here that uh, you got uh, sort of first three lifts of fish. You got uh, 12 tons in three days. Uh, we spent two or three days out there looking for the nets we last lost that fall. And uh, what we gathered up was terrible. I mean, it was, there was the, the nets were literally no good. I mean, what you could salvage was no good, and they were broke up. So uh, I had one old fellow with me. He's dead and gone now, Baldy Thorn. He said, I think what we should do is go and set some fresh nets and then maybe spend the odd day gathering these lost nets up, so which we did. And uh, we spent a couple of days more looking for lost nets and went out. Finally, we out and pulled the nets out, two or three nights, so it wasn't very long out. And uh, I think we pulled 50 nets for four ton of perch, which the boat wasn't that big, but we carried the perch. And I think we got 22 cents for that lift, and I think uh, the next lift we had four ton, we got 18. And the next lift we had four ton, we got 12. Yeah. And after that, the price went to rock by on three cents a pound. Yeah, three cents. And uh, a lot of the boats hadn't even got started yet, you know. Oh, I see. Yeah. But uh, those three lifts uh, was the foundation of the fishery we have today because we didn't have the money to buy the down well, payment on the fishery we have, you see. That's uh, that's when you made the down payment on the property. That yeah, is, no. uh, had we not made yeah. those three lifts, I don't know what would have happened. Maybe I'd have been working with you or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe. Well, tell me, in 1962, didn't the government put a floor price on uh, of eight cents a pound on fish? What year was that, George? 1962? Around well, I don't know just what year it was, but... Uh, as the, for about three or four years there, there was a lot of production yeah. of perch. Yeah. Uh, I think 65 was a big year, I'm not yeah. just sure. I, I can't remember the dates, but yeah, there was a lot of production of perch. And uh, I remember seeing a picture in uh, one of the papers that all that looks down in that uh, lake is not gold, it glitters, you know, yeah. it was a perch. <laughs> but, uh, uh, well, uh, <clears throat> They didn't put a floor price on it, eight yeah, cents. Yeah, and I, you had a little incident with one of the men who uh, uh, bought the fish from you, but uh, uh, you finally had to sue them, and you only got three cents anyway. Eh? Well, I think anybody in business those days uh, probably got stuck with a buyer or two, and uh, we did. I paid the men eight cents, and well, no, I settled for three. Yeah, in 74 and 75, you built your new building. Yeah, uh, that's true. And uh, you went into retailing. Or you went into retailing before that. Didn't? Well, we retailed at 62. Oh, yeah. Like, when we took that building over, that was the only alternative we had, George, was to uh, just catch a few fish and sell them on the yeah. store, you see. Because uh, my crew had left me. Yeah. I mean, they couldn't make no money at three cents a pound on commission, so they just took other jobs. Yeah. So, so I wound up fishing myself, yeah. and just with a family old fit, we just was uh, selling a few fish out of the story, you see. Yeah, and that was that started in really in the uh, early 60s. Oh, well, uh, 62, then, yeah. And uh, well, and you must have done all right in that art because in 74 and 75 you built your new building. Well, uh, I, in 75, let's see, 75. I just don't remember the years, but uh, I do remember the one year I did fish myself, that little boat right there. It was one of the best years I ever had. This little boat here? Yeah, that was one of the best years I ever had. Now, what's that the boat? That's an Oscar J. What's your Jackson spelled backwards? That's I don't know right, if they yeah. can pick that up or not. Uh, that boat had yeah. built three fisheries. That boat there was uh, had had built three fisheries. Yeah, it did. Oh, yeah. It, built, it was a foundation of Jackson fisheries and uh, fair-clad fisheries and grayling fisheries. You too, eh? Oh, yeah. Well, now, when you, when you go into the retailing business and uh, you're fishing pretty well by yourself, uh, now your wife plays a big part in this. Every time I see her, she's filleting fish and running the store. And well, I should have three more like her, but uh, every time I try to hire another girl, she wants to know whether she can uh, fill a fish, you see. <laughs> yeah. And she's quite an expert on smoking fish. Yeah, she's won several... Uh, Contests and smoking fish, and in fact, a couple of trophies she's won on the Great Lakes. Oh yeah, when they have that Hope Great Lakes fish, exhibition. Yeah. Well, now <clears throat> we're talking about <clears throat> um, 
most people go down to your shop and the fish are all filleted there and uh, uh, you were telling me that in the early 1940s uh, you didn't fill it because people like to buy to pick their own fish out if you're in <coughs> the retail business. Well, that's quite true. Like, uh, years ago, people wouldn't want to walk into a modern shop. Like, they always walked into the, they wanted to wade through the water and pick a fish out of a box. And, <laughs> and you know, I mean, this is the way the trend was those yeah, days. Yeah. The Jewish people and uh, anybody who wanted a big fish, they'd come in and pick the fish out of the box, and they'd take it home and clean it themselves. Yeah. And this was a trend. And uh, I do know for a fact that uh, not too many years ago, there was a fellow who tried and started a new modern fish store down there that uh, just went bellies up because the people wasn't ready for a fish store. But then later on, uh, as the generations, uh, you know, like the people, they, they, they didn't care for cleaning fish. The, no. the younger generations, they, they want something prepared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a sort of all food. Uh, uh, that's uh, right. So, well, just uh, tell me about the operations involved. Most people don't realize uh, how many uh, times those fish are handled. Uh, tell me about the operations involved. You go out and you set your nets. That's the first operation. Well, most people think that... Uh, when they walk in, they see the boat come in and say, well, you got a nice lift of fish there, and uh, how come you're charging so much for your fish? Yeah. And, uh, but people don't realize uh, how many times those fish are yeah. handled. Yeah. Now, like, if you set the nets, yeah. for instance, when you go and set the nets, yeah. the nets are laid, uh, those nets are pulled. I don't know if you got a pencil there or not, but you can mark probably the times that they're handled, but yeah. as those fish come aboard the boat, they got to be removed from the net one fish at a time. Yeah. And after removed from the net, they got to be iced and uh, taken care of. And then when you come to the dock, those fish have got to be unloaded again, loaded on the carts, and removed into the fish house. You're getting in two or three times already, aren't you? So after they're taken into the taken into the fish house, they got to be weighed because uh, the men on the boat. Have got to know the weights for their share. Yeah. So those fish should be weighed and re-iced. And uh, then they're packed in the cooler for the next day's operation. Now the next day's operation consists of those fish that got to be brought out and they've got to be lifted or shoveled up into the scaler and then they got to be put into the scaler one by one. Now after they come out of that scaler they go into a basket. They got to be lifted again put on the bench for the girls to fill it. Now that girl that's working there filleting those fish has got to grab each fish by hand, cut the head off it, yeah. fill it, then it's placed in another pan. So uh, after those fish are placed in that pan, they've got to be taken from there and weighed and placed in the five or ten pound cartons or whatever you're going to do with them or then taken to the freezer. So you're looking at probably about eight times the handling. Oh, I can see that. That fish has been handled eight yeah. times yeah. before it ever even gets to your table. <clears throat> and that's not counting all the uh, overhead expenses of running a boat and fuel well, oil and all the other oh, things. No. You want to believe it. Now listen, I want to get into a topic that kind of fascinates me, and that's the changing fish species in uh, uh, Lake Erie. Uh, you know, like, uh, I don't think Lake Erie's polluted, it's just a very, very rich lake. But what about the fish species? Now, we never have sturgeon anymore, eh? There's uh, very few sturgeon caught that I know of. Uh, we haven't got the pond netters along the lake now. We used to have the trap netters, yeah. and they used to catch a few of them. Yeah. Especially, uh, they used to come in the spawn around the time the cherry trees are ripe. But uh, we haven't got the pond netters or the trap netters to catch them now, and the gill nets that we fish are so light that you wouldn't catch them if they were there. You'd wind up with a hole in your net. Well, what about whitefish and, and herring? They were two of the greatest uh, fish uh, in Lake Erie. Uh, now we never see them. Uh, well, there's quite a story on that, George. Uh, you see, years ago, there was always whitefish and herring in the lake yeah. uh, for one reason that when the uh, Department of Natural Resources, they've gone to the, I don't know what they call them now, <laughs> but anyway, uh, 
I can name several names. But yeah, well, never mind. Department. We'll just leave it at Department of Natural Resources. Yeah. It is uh, connected with fisheries. Thing. Now, years ago, uh, we got. Uh, give me that question again there, just for a second, because I got about three answers for that. Well, a whitefish and herring. We, you know, the last big uh, herring run was 19, uh, what, 45, 46, 45, yeah. and 47. Yeah. Yeah. And now we never uh, get herring or whitefish. They seem to have. Uh, yeah, declined. well, during the years, like even like going back to that uh, picture when I was on that steam truck, just going back many moons ago, like every fall we took the spawn and yeah. those whitefish and herring. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, in fact, the government even paid us or paid a man to go on the lake for five dollars a day. They'd pay us or pay somebody to take yeah. the spawn. And what we do when those fish come around in that lecture, we take and milk those fish and yeah. take the spawn yeah. and put them in a five gallon milk tin you see yeah. and uh, for years and years we did that and then they went to the hatcheries and they went to Normandale hatcheries yeah. and different hatcheries when well, Normandale was one of the biggest hatcheries and uh, the United States and Canada had an international agreement at that time like uh, if we had too much spawn yeah. and we couldn't uh, hatch it out they would send the boat over from Erie which they did on several occasions, and they took that spawn back, yeah. and they hashed it over there, and they put it back in the lake. Yeah. Now this, as long as they did that, George, there was always lots of whitefish and herring in the lake. Now I do know this for a fact, yeah. and I, I, and in fact, the last time I was working on Donald Mac, we took spawn. And it was herring spawn, and I think it was about 1947. I think yeah. could be 47. I, I got to say, I'm not too familiar on the date. And we took the spawn, and I, I do believe at that time that that spawn was never hatched. It was fed to the trout in Normandale yeah, yeah. because at that time the government was more indulged in uh, raising trout for the sports fishermen. Well, now this this is a big uh, <clears throat> sort of uh, argument that the commercial fishermen have, uh, really because of the uh, agitation of sports fishermen, especially in Michigan, I think, and Ontario too. Uh, the uh, government uses their uh, uh, farms for raising uh, uh, spawn, you know, and uh, uh, they produce sports fish instead well, of this, the herring. Well, it's been a known fact for the last 20 years, George, uh, is all they've done is produce sports fish. Yeah. I mean, I could take you up to uh, King Carden yeah. and Wyarton, or I shouldn't say King Carden, but Wyarton. I was at the hatchery there, and there were there was one, one woman running the whole hatchery, yeah. and there was millions of splake and rainbows. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, and uh, trout species, yeah. and there was only one woman looking after it. You see. Uh, so that uh, those fish are all right, and they're getting into the rivers and the creeks and the streams and so on, and that's all right for the sports fishermen. But uh, not only did the white fish and the herring disappear, but the blue and yellow pickerel uh, declined. Now, did they ever uh, raise them in the hatchery? <clears throat> well, uh, this is my own opinion. Maybe somebody will disagree with me with it. But uh, we did have pickerel years ago, but not too much. Years years ago, we never had too many pickerel. Like years ago, when we fished out for whitefish out in the yeah. uh, steamboat courses, when we got done fishing for whitefish, we brought our nets inside, maybe two or three miles off the beach, yeah. and we'd pick out what we called hards. They were big pickerel, and they were dark pickerel. They weren't the pickerel that we caught at the time you mentioned. But uh, the most pickerel we seen was uh, W.F. Colby in Port Dover at one time. He put a bunch of pickerel in Silver Lake, and I do believe in my own mind that this was uh, the pickerel hatch that we had here for the few years that we did oh, have see. pickerel. Yeah. In other words, it's a And they had a hatch in the yeah. lake. Now, I really believe that they had a hatch. Like, yeah. he let those pickerel go in yeah. Silver Lake, yeah. and they migrated up the, yeah. up the Long Point to uh, Port Burwell and Port yeah. Stanley, yeah. and they did have a hatch. Yeah. I think this, they lasted for a few years. Yeah. Can I just ask something? You've got a theory on, one of your theories on the declines is uh, connected with the spawning dates of the fish. Eh? Now, the herring and whitefish spawn in November, uh, and uh, the smelt spawn in April, the perch spawn in May, uh, uh, the pickerel spawn in the spring. Now, those are kind of nice weather conditions, but November is a kind of a terrible... Well, November, the whitefish spawn, and December, well, November and December is when the herring and in November, the whitefish spawn. They spawn six, seven fathom water, and your herring spawn along the edge of the rock, or maybe nine miles off. But this is uh, in December, and that. But it's the worst time of the year for a fish to spawn. Yeah. Now, your your uh, hatch for those fish 
uh, but natural resorts, like natural, like, yeah. you know, would be 1%, maybe 1 100%, 1 unless you had a beautiful weather. Yeah. Yeah. And many a day, I'll just tell you, for instance, uh, how many days on the 11th of November you walked up Talbot Street, you didn't have to pull your hat down over your no, head? No, I know. Huh? November's an awful month. That's quite yeah. true. And around yeah. Poppy Day was the yeah. time uh, yeah. would, uh, whitefish yeah. would spawn. Well, then what you're saying is that <clears throat> when we go back and look at graphs of the fish, we'll see they go up and they go down, up and down. Uh, now, sometimes this is they've had a very good spawning, eh? And, uh, but your argument is that unless the uh, government uh, uses their hatcheries to uh, uh, spawn some of these uh, fish, herring and whitefish and pickerel, mm -hmm. the, the fish the lake was noted for, that uh, nothing, they're not going to be replaced any other way, eh? Uh, it's a known fact, George. As long as they put, uh, we took the spawn and put the spawn back in the lake, yeah. we always had whitefish, eh? Yeah. And, and uh, herring. Yeah. And right now, uh, they were individual eggs that they spawned, by the way. Yeah. Now the perch, they spawn in a jelly mash like a frog's eggs. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, pretty hard for me to sum it up here, but uh, the perch spawn in May, which is a good time of the year. The smelt spawn in the spring. And uh, it's pretty hard for me to sum it up to say, well, now if the white fish and the herring spawn in the spring, Maybe we could have a lake full of white fish in here. No, I, uh, because the pickerel spawn in the spring, and uh, we have had, uh, uh, haven't been too successful with the pickerel, eh? Uh, well, I have my theories about that, too. Yeah. Until the smelt moved into the lake, now this is my theory, now you yeah. can talk to biologists all you want, but uh, I still go by some of the old timers. Listen, Art, can I just interrupt you? Can you tell me, uh, smelt aren't a native fish, um, the lakes. Now, where did the smelt come from and how did they get into the lake? Well, as near as I know, George, uh, there was some guy up in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, had some in the pond. Yeah. Now, this is near as I can nail it down to, and apparently the pond washed out and they got in the lake from up there. And now, then, they're actually an ocean fish, but apparently that's how they got in the lake. And they're uh, now is what classified in some ways as a junk fish. We'll come back to that. Now, let's uh, get back to your theory about the pickerel. Because well, my theory on the, the pickerel was, uh, I used to fish with a guy down there by the name of Mac Loader, and he was, I think, like, uh, everybody knew, like, the old fishermen knew sign. Like, you yeah. go by the sign. They, they knew what, they, 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 they knew, they knew what, how the fish movements went, but they didn't know why. Yeah, yeah. Well, with the electronic equipment we got now and, yeah. and the thermometers, I think we can figure out why these fish move. Yeah. But uh, I think myself, as old Max said, uh, when you don't see no small fish and the fish start getting bigger, you're in for a rough time. Yeah. Now, when these smelt moved into the lake, uh, I think that the fish ate them and grew bigger and bigger and bigger. And I really think that they made them sterile. That they dredged the eggs up. I understand they dredged the eggs up in the middle of the lake where the blue spawn, that's the blue pickerel. And they weren't, uh, they weren't fertile. They weren't fertile. Yeah. Now my belief is, now I might be wrong, I don't know. My belief is that the smelt has made these blue pickerel so that the, ha the, the fertilizers, I don't know what I mean. So yeah, they don't they 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 lose their out. fertility and you don't but, get a, but my belief is, too, that if you took pickerel and put them in the lake, that they'd survive on these smelt. Yeah. I mean, they'll live. They'll get bigger, big, big. Yeah, that's if you took the pickerel and raised them in a hatch. Right. And, and then put them out that's, in the lake, that's, uh, that's they'd right. have all those that's smelt. That's exactly right. And alewives and yep. so on. I'd like to see it proven. Now, I understand yeah. through the grapevine the government's supposed to do something on yeah. these lines, but... We've been, I've heard this for 40 years. No, I, uh, <clears throat> this seems to be a big argument of, uh, uh, that the government has leaned over to supporting the sports fishermen. Well, it's a big industry, George. Now, we had 125 licenses on Lake Erie commercial fishermen, and we only pay $125 a year license for our license. But there's only probably, maybe, I'd say 1,000, maybe there's 1,500 workers in the industry. Today, you mean? Oh yeah, maybe, well say 2,000, right? let's, let's say 2,000 uh, employees on 125 licenses because everybody's cut down to short crews. Now, if you've got uh, six or 10,000 anglers, 
signing petitions. I mean, uh, you've got a lot They're of clout votes, there. Eh? You've got a lot of clout, yeah. huh? Yeah, you do. Now, regardless of whether politics or not, I mean, you got to, you got to take the, you got to pick the meat out of it. Yeah. And well, the smelt uh, are an interesting fish. You think that they may have caused the decline of the perch. That's an interesting theory. Uh, and I kind of like it. Now let's move on to one other uh, traumatic experience you had in 1970. We had the big mercury scare, eh? <clears throat> oh yeah, there's always something. <laughs> yeah, what? we've uh, we had that. I had uh, 21 people employed at that time. You did? Yeah. Were you fishing and two boats or? No, I had six, seven men on the boat and I had uh, 10 or 12 women in the shanty yeah. working. That's mm -hmm. when we really went big, eh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thought we were going big. And but then, we got shot down pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, well, that mercury thing, you know, happened up in Lake St. Clair, and then <clears throat> uh, everybody talking about the pollution of uh, Lake Erie, and then the government announcements back and forth, and everybody just stopped eating fish, eh? You're quite true. Like, our business, like, in those days, uh, which wasn't too heavy, I mean, but we were selling as high as $300 worth of fish on a weekend. Yeah. And our business that last week, like, the, 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 the time that the mercury hit, yeah. Our sales for the next week was one pound. One pound. And I fish. remember the guy that bought the pound was Isaac Reitman. <laughs> he said, I'm not afraid of eating them. Yeah. And that was quite true. <clears throat> and there, there wasn't any mercury in any of those perch anyway, were there? Well, I couldn't tell you, George. I'm not a biologist or whatever, no, or scientist. But, uh, I know I've ate them for a year, and I drank out of the lake, and I yeah, still feel pretty yeah, healthy. Yeah. <laughs> now, one other uh, problem we... Uh, uh, have here. I think we have a few minutes to cover. That's the algae. And you were saying that you noticed a great increase in algae uh, in, in the, a wet spring. Quite true. Like if we have a real rain spring, like a lot of rain, I notice that we have more algae in the lake than what we do we have a dry spring. Now my theory of it is that like the way they've had the farmers, now they're draining all the fields now yes, with tile. Yes, yeah. And they're using a high potential of uh, fertilizer yeah, yeah. and uh, I really believe that uh, we get a heavy rain at the time that they put their crops in yeah, yeah. Uh, like a heavy rain yeah. that, that stuff washes off and because I do know like talking to farmers that grow tobacco that if they have a heavy rain uh, they've got to go over and side dress it yeah. you know what they call by side dressing is yeah. they got to go and re-fertilize it That's to right. get the tobacco drawn so now that fertilizer runs in the lake and yeah. there's no there's no there's no question in my mind that that the algae is formed from the fertilizer yeah. from a wet uh, runoff. Well, this is really what makes uh, <clears throat> Lake Erie a very rich lake. It's very rich in fertilizer and nutrients for the mm -hmm. plants. Eh? But the, besides that algae, which you notice increases in the spring, and some people say that it too has interfered with spawning beds and things. Eh? Well, I, can, I don't know too much about that, George. I, we don't, uh, like I say, if you have a wet spring, well then we see a lot of algae, but uh, the perch, they spawn in a jellied mass, you see. Now, it could interfere with perches spawning in individual eggs, but yeah. uh, these perch spawn like frogs. They're all in a jellied mass, and, yeah. and it's, uh, for sure there's going to be a certain yeah. percentage of them hatch out. Well, then there's one other kind of algae you get, and that's um, uh, red algae. You can tell about that. Yeah, no, there's something that uh, you mentioned. I don't know how you found out about that, but every year, uh, the time the perch spawn, we do run across that for a period of maybe 10 to 12 or 15 days. And I never heard anybody ever mention about it, but it comes and disappears. And it is hot. It's a, it's a, it's an algae that gets in the nets and uh, it's either animal or something. I don't know how you describe it, but it's very hot. If it gets on your face, it burns your face. Art, we've got three minutes and I got two questions that I want to ask you. One is, uh, just, uh, uh, this is not a matter of bragging what a wealthy man you are, but can you just give me some idea of uh, the investment you have in fishing right now, like the Lee J. Mm -hmm. How much would it cost to replace that now? Not well, much you paid if you're for. looking at, like, not even electronic equipment, you're looking at probably $2,000 a foot. That's with electronics and everything. Yeah, yeah. Well, in other words, like a 40-foot boat's going to cost you about 40000 and then the electronics are... Oh, well, you're looking at $80,000 $80, That's electronics. Yeah. So you have, in those electronics, you have, uh, just what do you have? That. Uh, well, I have uh, two fish finders, three radios, and I have a Loran C, which is a digital readout that you can tell where you are in the lake every 50 feet. 
and we have radar yeah. and uh, well, there's several pieces of equipment, you know. Yeah. And this is all very, very expensive. And uh, then uh, just in your fish house where you process the thing, you have a scaler. Yeah, well, the scaler, I bought the scaler at the time. I bought the scaler, the used scaler, and for 3500 and now it's up to 11000 yeah. yeah. Listen, Art, <clears throat> just to close this, uh, what's going to happen to the commercial fishing on uh, Lake Erie if uh, we don't change? Uh, well, if the government don't come along and start putting some fish in the lake, there's too much pressure put on these perch right now, and the outlook for commercial fishermen looks pretty grim. Uh, I would say that we've got to get some s different species put back into this lake and take the pressure off these perch because the season is getting shorter, the cost of living is going up, the fuel oil is going up, and uh, we're trying to make a weekly living out of it. And unless the government comes to us and puts different species of fish back in the In lake, other words, unless they go back and start the hatcheries We've got to start these hatcheries yeah. up or we're going to be in big trouble. Yeah. All right, I'm going to have to close this. Uh, I'd uh, like to thank everybody very much for watching. I'd like to thank you, Art, for uh, giving us a lesson in commercial fishing. And I'd uh, like to remind you that this is the last program we have this year and that uh, it will be re-shown on uh, Friday of this week, which is June the 13th. And it'll be shown on the next Friday, which is June the 20th. And uh, thank you for watching, and good night.